When it comes to the racial makeup of a neighborhood in New Orleans, our origin story describes our city as sort of like a gumbo made up of different flavors fused together to make a bowl of culture like none other. But over time, the ingredients, or rather the people in that gumbo, began to separate, and it wasn't by coincidence, nor is it any coincidence we see that same separation today. Now consider this. This is a study from the New Orleans Data Center from 2020. That study says 17 neighborhoods are still more than 80% black, while neighborhoods like Algiers Point and the Garden District, Uptown and Audubon, those communities are more than 60% white, and that is a stark divide. But that divide was pushed by policies and practices meant to segregate and isolate or de jure segregation. Throughout our Follow the Line series, we will roll out how that isolation had a negative effect. But first, I asked some of our experts to expound on more of those discriminatory practices that made their way from the federal government to possibly the land deed that you hold on your home. This is episode two of Follow the Line. From the pre 1930s uh -huh. all the way to about 1970 or so, the amount of homes built in New Orleans. And if you do a simple calculation on what those houses sold for back then and what they sell for today, right? Right. And how much lost wealth as a result of that. That you basically froze it out of. You gotta think about that. Right. That that is like massive. So you don't have any you don't have any equity in a home, you're not able to build any wealth no. and you have nothing to pass on. Imagine if we were all given a fair shake, how different this city could be. Our lives are at further risk. There's a common narrative that what we see in present day New Orleans is the result of our own past actions or inaction. Come and throw me out of my home that I don't work and pay it for. History and data connects our present day problems to past policy. 15 an hour. Policies designed to limit or really even eliminate opportunities in minority communities. If I lose my job, where am I going? Policies whose legacies have become so institutionalized that while the physical line has been erased, the mental and social line remains. Living in a car, being depressed, being stressed out, not having food to eat is not an excuse. So could a line drawn generations ago result in the poverty, crime, lack of education, and many other issues some New Orleanians face today? Until we start investing in people and put the political agendas aside, the city is gonna continue to burn. How do we get to this point? Why are these attitudes, how have these attitudes become so kind of prevalent and, and ingrained in us to think this way? Like even when we think about the, the neighborhoods, the communities, well, those people don't want to, and I hear those people a lot, they don't want this, those people don't want to do these things, or yeah. pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, but you're and, not gonna say what caused you to be in a position to try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We follow the line from the origin story of New Orleans to the Civil War, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow laws, to racial zoning laws, single family zoning, then redlining. It's a line that left a trail of barriers for African Americans, one that's generations long, but the tactics of exclusion didn't stop there. Back in the old days, we actually had racial covenants where you know you were required um, to only you know sell to a certain race. If any property owner tries to transfer the property to a black resident, then anyone in the neighborhood can sue to enforce the covenant. If it's enforced, it could mean that a black homeowner could be evicted from the property that they purchased. And that's not even if they, they don't owe anything, they didn't do anything. Correct. It's just because they're black in a, in a white neighborhood. Correct. And what do you have that you can show me today? Nothing in this uh, price range. Nothing at all.
This practice was prevalent between the 1910s and the 60s. The 1948 Shelley v. Kramer Supreme Court decision found racially restrictive covenants can't legally be enforced. Still, the practice continued under the rug. Even after all the, the old racial covenants were uh, stricken down by the Supreme Court, so even though it wasn't, it couldn't be enforced in law anymore, there was a sort of an unwritten social contract that if you were going to sell your home, if you were a white homeowner and you were going to sell your home, you would only sell your home to another white homeowner because you wanted to maintain the, the current racial structure of the neighborhood. It wasn't until the passing of the 1968 Fair Housing Act that sweeping legislation was designed to end all discriminatory housing. Still, the language can be found in some deeds today. So when you look at redlining and things like restrictive covenants, uh, it was meant to disenfranchise and to segregate. Will you, can you say that it worked? Absolutely, it worked. Well, there's a lot of things that we haven't had because of racism. Housing discrimination was banned on paper, but white realtors would use another concept to alter the racial makeup of neighborhoods now forced to integrate. Real estate agents, white real estate agents, would basically scare the crap out of white homeowners. Here's how they would do it. They would, sort of, for example, hire an African-American to drive through the neighborhood playing loud music, hiring an African-American woman to walk down the neighborhood pushing a stroller with black kids in it, having an African-American call a white household using a traditional black name and scare the crap out of them, right? That's blockbusting. This is the one of the councils that Someone who knows all too well about the practice is former city council member Jim Singleton. So you go through the process, you get the house, everything goes smoothly. And I you thought it was anyway. So you start to move in. Yeah. What happens? The day I was moving, that was March the 13th. I remember that date, 1968, when I was getting ready to move in. The gentleman next door. Keep in mind, it's all white. I'm moving into the middle of a neighborhood that is all white at the time. And he swore that he would never spend a night in the block with a colored person. So I backed up to move in. He backed up with a uh, U-Haul to move out. And the process started from there. The next morning when I woke up and looked outside, there was a, a for see a sign on every house and, and not just this block, but in the in this area around. I had heard about it and read about it from other places, but I never had the experience of dealing with it. Blockbusting lent itself to another discriminatory practice called steering. Realtors started steering white folks into certain neighborhoods and black folks into others, um, steering black folks away from certain neighborhoods. They were doing it so that they would put the fear in white individuals so now they can jump to the suburbs where all of the support was coming from the federal government through the FHA and the VHA building suburban homes. While wider suburban families benefited from VA and FHA loans, the Treasury Department says there is evidence to show the FHA rarely insured loans to low-income urban neighborhoods where most black Americans lived in the 1930s. Left in the city's urban core, black families were sold the homes left behind by white families, but at a more expensive rate under less desirable terms. With the limited ability to get capital funding and low-wage jobs, we began to see the impact of white flight. Okay, now here's some homes for you. What are we going to do? charge you higher interest rates, or we're gonna allow you to buy it on contract. If you miss one payment, we're gonna take the house from you. But guess what, you don't build any equity. I just think that people did not have the, the money or the resources in terms of the, the job that they had and what the payment was and then moving in.
you could also see the deterioration to some extent in the properties. They just weren't kept up to the level that they had been before. So this story is a giant real estate play. Even the constant moving around of African Americans, when we jump into the period of urban, urban renewal, building of the um, um, uh, Claiborne Bridge, all of that stuff is about a real estate. Everything is a real estate play. So when black residents were steered to different parts of the community, it wasn't always in the most desirable areas. One of those areas built specifically for low-income black families left them fighting for their lives, literally. In our next episode of Follow the Line, we explore how Gordon Plaza residents landed on the agricultural street landfill and how they're fighting to get off of it almost 30 years later. That's tomorrow night on the Eyewitness News at 10.